Oh no, where is it? Oh, oh! Hi guys, welcome back to another video. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I'm Matt and I usually make giant redstone games, but today I want to spice things up a little bit. One topic that's always been interesting to me is computer graphics. I mean, how does something like your GPU render video games, shaders, simulations, and so many other cool things? It's amazing how advanced everything's become and I really want to try doing some graphics in Minecraft. That just sounds so cool. So what's the best way to start doing redstone graphics? Well, in spirit of not getting too overwhelmed, let's make a machine that can render just one type of geometry, lines. Specifically, we want to make a machine that takes any two coordinate points as input, for example, 3, 4, and 20, 50, and the machine draws a line between them while staying as straight as possible. As much as I want to start building, this is just not a project that I can build right away. Instead, I need to do some research to find a good line drawing algorithm, or a set of instructions that, when given two points, can just draw the line for us. Once we find a nice algorithm, then we'll implement it into Minecraft, and if we do everything right, we should be able to draw any line with just redstone. Okay, after like 10 minutes of searching, it seems like the most popular algorithm is Bresenham's algorithm. According to this, it was first developed back in 1962, so it must be pretty good if it's stuck around and it's still popular. Now I'm gonna go try to understand how it works. I'll see you in a bit. All right, that went pretty well. It's been a few hours and I think I have a decent understanding of it now. Let me explain. To simplify things, let's assume that you're plotting a line from the point x1, y1 to the point x2, y2. The line goes from left to right and bottom to top, or in math terms, x2 is bigger than x1 and y2 is bigger than y1. The slope of the line is between zero and one, and we're only dealing with pixels that are on or off, like redstone lamps. So at a high level, Bresenham's algorithm looks like this. For every single x value, x1 through x2, figure out the y value that needs to go there and then draw the pixel. Okay, simple enough. And because of the assumptions I made, determining the y value is simpler than you might think. No matter what your line looks like, when you go to draw the next pixel, you only have two options. You can either just continue drawing the line at the current y level, like this, or you can increase y by one and draw the next pixel up here. And those are the only two options you have for drawing the next pixel. All right, let's update the code. We still go through all the x's, but now if we need to increment y, we do it. Otherwise, we don't. And then we draw the pixel. Okay. But how do we know when we should increment y? Well, this is where Bresenham's genius kicks in. He figured out that if you keep track of the error, or how far off the real line is compared to the drawn pixel, you can use the error to tell you when you need to increase y. It took me a while to understand what the error actually was when I was learning, so let me give you a few examples to make things as clear as possible. Let's say this is the line we're trying to draw right here, and we've determined that the gray shaded pixel is the pixel that should be drawn. The error would then be the y value on the line minus the y value in the middle of the pixel. So in this case, 2.4 minus 2 gives us an error of 0.4. Or if the drawn pixel is here, the error is 2.8 minus 2, which is 0.8. Okay, now that we know what error is, let's walk through Bresenham's algorithm. Let's say I want to draw a line from 1, 1 to 6, 3. We start by drawing the initial point, which is 1, 1, and our error right now is 0, because the middle of the pixel we just drew and the point on the line are right on top of each other. So far, so good. Now, here comes the looping part. We move over in x by 1, and we need to fix our error, because it's not 0 anymore. And that's actually pretty easy to do, because you can just use the slope. Slope is how much y changes for every unit change in x. So all we need to do to get the new error is add the slope, which in this case is is 0.4. So our new error is 0.4. Now we have to decide whether to draw this pixel or this pixel. So here's the critical part. Bresenham noticed that if the error is greater than one half, it's a better decision to draw the higher pixel. And if the error is less than one half, it's a better decision to draw the lower pixel. So in our case, the error of 0.4 is less than one half, so we draw the next pixel here. And now we repeat the process. Move over in x by one, fix the error by adding the slope. So now our error is 0.8. 0.8 is greater than one half, so plot the next pixel here. Also, since our pixel got moved up, we need to subtract one from the error to account for that. And yeah, that's pretty much it. You repeat that process until you hit your endpoint, which in our case is 6.3. It's honestly a really elegant algorithm and it's fun to watch too. Let's go back to the code. Back at the code, this is what it looks like now. Start the error at zero, just like in the animation, calculate the slope because you're gonna need it, and draw your first pixel. Then for the loop, you still go through every x, x1 through x2, add the slope to the error to make the error correct, and if the error is greater than or equal to one half, increment y, and decrease error by one to account for that. Now, I think this code snippet right here is the absolute best way to understand the algorithm, and it does work. You can try it out yourself. But unfortunately, this is not exactly Bresenham's algorithm. You see, calculating the real slope is expensive because division is a slow operation for computers. So to make the algorithm work with just addition and subtraction, which are lightning fast, he changed some of these values around. And don't worry if you don't get why he made these changes, I'm actually not gonna explain it in this video. But I still have to talk about it because this is what we're implementing. Instead of adding slope, he adds two times delta y, which we'll just call a. Instead of subtracting one, he subtracts two delta x, which we'll call b. He changed the start value of error to two delta 
y minus delta x. And finally, instead of comparing the error to one half, he compares it to zero. The math behind all those changes gets a little more complicated. And if you're interested in that, I've left some resources in the description. But the point is, after those small changes, this is the final version of Bresenham's algorithm. It doesn't involve any division and it still works just fine. That's really cool. Honestly, I think this will be good enough for redstone. I mean, it's not gonna be as simple as like a door, but I think I can manage it. Before we start building though, it's probably a good idea to code it in Python and actually get it to run. That way we can use it as a reference if we need to debug the redstone later. I'll be right back. Okay, I spent some time making it in Python and it should be fully done now. Oh, and I added some redstone lamp screen code that I had lying around and now, we can simulate what it's going to look like on the screen. Awesome. Oh man, I'm really excited now. This is going to look amazing on the real screen. There is one problem that I've been avoiding though. This algorithm, as it stands, doesn't automatically work for all types of lines. Remember in the assumptions, we're only dealing with lines that increase in x, increase in y, and have a slope between 0 and 1. That's pretty restrictive, and these types of lines only cover about an eighth of all the possible lines there are, because if you start every line at the origin, then only the ones in this octant, or this eighth of space, follow our assumptions. If you label these 1 through 8, it turns out that only lines in octant 1 will work. But I'm not too worried about this. I have some ideas for how to handle it later. For now, let's just pretend this problem doesn't exist and finally start building. As with any computational build, you want to start by building one component at a time, and then connect them all up later. And for this build, we're going to need quite a few different components. Let's start with, I'll call it the initialization component. Something where we can input x1, y1, x2, and y2, and it'll generate the two constants we need, a and b. And we can also have it generate the starting value for error while we're at it. In other words, something that handles this part of the code. I think x1, y1, x2, and y2 being 6 bits each is a good start, I mean we can always change it later. This is still big enough to plot to a 64 by 64 screen, since 6 bits can hold 64 Four different numbers. Now to calculate a, b, and the starting error, I'm going to use a carry cancel adder, which is a popular type of binary adder for Minecraft. If you're interested in how these work, I cover them in this video right here. Most of the operations are subtractions and not additions, but you can actually use an adder as a subtractor really easily. And I've explained how to do that in this video right here. Okay, I made it into a subtractor and I also made it light blue. So for example, if we do 5 minus 3, we're gonna get two. And this is actually already a way to calculate both A and B. I mean, A is two times Y2 minus Y1, right? So let's say this column is Y2 and this column is Y1. Y2 minus Y1 gives us this. And now to multiply it by two, you just do that. Adding another zero to the bottom just multiplies it by two. So now if you think of this as y2 and y1, it'll calculate a. And if you think about it as x2 and x1, it'll just calculate b. So a and b are done. And for starting error, we can just use more subtractors doing more similar things. I'll be back when the initialization component is finished. All right, initialization component, done. Here we have the four inputs, x1, x2, y1, and y2. And on the output, we have a, starting value of error, and b. Let's try it out. So I'll input 1, 1 as the first point, and 5, 4 as the second point. And this is correct. a is 6, b is 8, and the starting value of error is 2. Very nice. All right, initialization component is done, and this part of the code is taken care of. Let's move on to the loop. To keep track of the loop, we need a component to iterate from x1 to x2, which simulates this line of code right here. To do that, I'll start with a binary counter, or a device that can count up in binary, and modify it. Okay, here's a binary counter I had in my schematic and I think we'll be able to use it. When you press this button, it just counts up in binary. So one, two, three, and so on. So let's add some inputs behind it, one for x1 and one for x2, and modify this so that it counts from x1 to x2. Okay, I've been working on it a little bit. I think it's time to give it its first test. Let's say we want to iterate from one to four. So x1 is one, x2 is four. Press this button. We should get one through four. No, just a one. Okay, okay, I changed some timings. So let's try that again. One, two, three, four, beautiful. Let's give it another test. This time we'll go from, I don't know, seven to 10, seven, eight, nine, 10 and stop. That is amazing. All right, the iterator component or whatever you want to call it is done, which takes care of this line of code. Now for the contents of the main loop. This is going to be a bit of a challenge. We need to make a circuit that repeats this over and over again. Add A to error, check to see if error is greater than zero. If so, increment Y and subtract B. The faster we can get this loop running, the faster our line drawer will be because every cycle of the loop draws a pixel. Therefore, the speed of this component is really, really important. So I'm going to try my best to find the most optimal way to do it. I'll be back when I've got my first prototype. All right, I think I might have a working prototype of the main loop component. If everything works, this should simulate the contents of the loop. The inputs are are B, starting error, and A. And in the real line drawer, we'll feed in those values from the initialization component because that's what generates those for us. The output comes out of the top right here. It's a stream of the decisions. So it's literally a binary stream where a one or a signal being on represents the error was greater than or equal to zero. 
and a zero or a signal being off means it wasn't. Also, I got the speed of the loop to be six ticks, which I think is pretty good. I mean, I don't have anything to compare it to, but it seems pretty fast. Anyways, enough talking. Let's actually test this thing out. I think a good first test would be the line from the walkthrough earlier. So one, one to six, three. Let me go calculate what A, B and starting error should be for that line. I'll be right back. Okay, values are set up and now we can test it. We're expecting to see an output of zero, one, zero, one, zero, because those are the decisions of whether or not to increase Y when you plot this line. Let's press the button and okay, okay, zero, one, zero, one, Dude, no way. It actually worked. I mean, I was expecting this one to take the longest, but it literally took less time than the stupid iterator thing. I mean, I still have to test it some more, but after that case worked, I'm pretty confident it'll just work for everything. <laughs> Let's go, dude. All right, at this point, all of the major components are built. We have an initialization component that takes x1, y1, x2, and y2 and calculates the three values we need. A, B, and starting error. We have an iterator component which will iterate from X1 to X2, simulating this for loop. And we have a main data loop which generates a stream of the decisions that tells us when to increment Y while the loop is running. This is really coming together. Well, not literally, because now we have to actually put it together. It's time to start assembly. We need to come up with a layout for this line drawer that fits all of our components together nicely. So let's move some stuff around. Okay, I think this is a good basic layout for the line drawer. You have your initializer out front, which feeds A, B, and starting error into the main loop. You have the iterator component thing here, which we're using for X, and you also have a regular binary counter to hold Y. And we can plug the decision stream from this guy into here, which will increment Y at the correct times. I'll be back when everything is hooked up. Okay, everything is hooked up and ready to go. This is starting to look pretty cool. It's like a spaceship or something. Let's start with a super basic test aligned from 1, 1 to 7, 7. If we did everything right, we should see the points come out as 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, etc. And then it'll stop at 7, 7. Here we go. There's no way it's going to work first try, but I can can hope and one two th oh this one is not okay look like the one on the left is only staying at one that's an issue time for everyone's favorite debugging okay i've literally been debugging this thing for about six hours and it's uh it's it's really frustrating i'm not gonna lie each component on its own works just fine but as soon as they try to talk to each other everything keeps falling apart it'll work for one case and then not another and then it'll work for that case but not the first one it's like dude Come on. And this is especially annoying because even if I do get this to work, it's still only going to be able to graph one eighth of all the possible lines. Because in the beginning, I said this line drawer only works for lines in octant one. Whew, uh, I'm going to go take a break, pet my dog. Uh, I'll be back when I have a plan for the rest of the video. Okay, I'm back. I feel better now. And uh, here's what I'm thinking. Making a line drawer that only works for one eighth of all lines sucks. I mean, I did have a plan to fix it, but I just think it's way too much work for what it's worth. I'm thinking there's got to be like a more generalized version of Bresenham's algorithm, something that would automatically work for all lines. And I was right. It was just a bit harder to find online, but this is Bresenham's algorithm for all octants. You can input any start point and any end point and it'll just work. The code gets a bit more complicated, obviously, but I think this is still manageable. So I'm going to scrap this, which is kind of disappointing, but this is one of those times where I think getting a fresh start will really help me out. Plus the new line drawer is going to work for all lines, so it's not for nothing. And about eight hours or so of work later, I think I finally have a working line drawer for any type of line. I was going to dive into the details of this new line drawer as I was building it, but after realizing how long this video already is, I decided not to. But trust me, I've been testing this thing thoroughly, giving it a bunch of edge cases, comparing it to the new code, and I'm pretty sure we have a winner. So now you can pick any two points and it should just work. So let's try 2010 to 3263, bop, and over here it just outputs all the points of that line. It's really hard to read binary that fast, I can't do that, but I did check it tediously one point at a time and it does work. Those were all the correct points for the line. I think it's time to start work on the screen so that we can see these points being plotted for real. Normally when I make screens, I just make a single XY plotter, which takes an X coordinate and a Y coordinate as input. As you can see, if we input three, five and press right, we get the pixel at three comma five. Well, assuming that the origin or the point zero zero is in the bottom left. This screen is great because you can plot any X, Y point you want pretty easily, but it's also pretty limiting because you can only plot one point at a time, which means that in our case, we're only gonna be able to draw one line at a time. However, recently I came across this video by Jarvi, which is a tutorial for how to make a pass through screen, which means a screen that can plot multiple points at the same time. So how cool would it be if we took Jarvi's screen, copied our line drawer a bunch of times and plotted a bunch of lines to this screen at the same time. 
I think that would be really cool. So I'm gonna go watch Jarvie's video and I'll be back when I have a working pass-through screen. Okay, if I did everything right, this should be a 64 by 64 pass-through screen. Down here, we have four separate XY inputs, which can all plot to the screen at the same time. And four is not the limit or anything, I just chose that. I mean, you can stack this module as many times as you want. You'll be able to use all of them at once. For example, I can go onto this guy and plot two, three, and then go over here and plot two, four. And when we look at the screen, both of them get plotted to the screen. I think it's time to hook up some line drawers. But before we go crazy with a bunch of line drawers, let's just try one to make sure it works. Okay, he's hooked up and ready to go. I am so excited. Let's try something huge, just full confidence. I'll pick some point in the top left and then another point in the bottom right and we'll see what it does. Here we go. Oh no, where is it? Oh, oh, <laughs> look at this thing. That's so fast. That is so fast. Oh my god. All of my hours of debugging were worth it for just that moment. That's insane! Line drawer! Now we can just copy the line drawer a bunch of times and have them all draw to the screen at once. I'll see you in the showcase. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe, it really helps me out. And let me know what you want to see next in the comments. I hope you learned something, I hope you enjoyed. Peace out guys.